Welcome to the Jim Harrison Society. Responding to the poetry of Jim Harrison, Texts and Voices, American Literature Association, Summer 2021. The Jim Harrison Society is a group of the American Literature Association. We wish to express thanks to the American Literature Association for supporting our work and for making a virtual presentation option available in these times. We regret the absence of our colleague and friend, Rick Wallach, who's ill at this time. We hope for his speedy return to Harrison Scholarship. Inquiries can be directed to Chris Johnson at this email address. Scott Hendry will begin his doctoral studies in literature at the University of Arkansas in the fall. He just finished an MA in literature and cultural studies at the University of Oklahoma centering his work upon the rhetorics of place and space, indigenous and decolonial literature and critical theory. Scott will focus his PhD research upon the varied literatures of the American West, literary cartography, geocriticism, and sociocultural spatial theory. Stephen Spencer is an actor and bibliophile based in Chicago. He supports his book collecting habit with theater, voiceover, film, and TV work. Currently, he can be seen as Dr. David Harvard in season four of Fargo on FX. Steve's been a devoted Jim Harrison reader since 1990, and he edits and administrates, administers the popular Jim Harrison author page on Facebook. Though born in Schenectady, New York, he grew up moving back and forth between East Coast and Midwestern states before being shipwrecked in Indiana in time for high school and college. He holds a journalism degree from Indiana University and an MFA in acting from the FSU, a solo conservatory. Chris C.W. Johnson is a scholar and educator in education, language, and literacy with interests in classroom practices involving reading and writing. His journey in literacy involves a lifelong passion for literature related to the natural environment. He is currently working on a manuscript addressing Jim Harrison and the natural world. So we'll hear our presenters in order, Scott, Steve, and then Chris. Um, Scott will be our first presenter with spatialized imagery and storied place events in the theory and practice of rivers. Thank you, Chris. Share the screen. Places are essential to our narratives as we experience and navigate the life worlds in which we exist. Jim Harrison's poem, The Theory and Practice of Rivers, imagines and represents life as a river journey. The poem is dedicated in memory of Harrison's 16-year-old niece, Gloria, who died quite unexpectedly in 1979. And the poem both spatializes and gives material form to Harrison's process of mourning. The central argument of my presentation is that in reading the theory and practice of rivers, place may be conceptualized as a storied event in process. Phenomenologist and geospatial philosopher Jeff Malpas states, quote, the crucial point about the connection between place and experience is not that place is properly something only encountered in experience, but rather that place is integral to the very structure and possibility of experience. It's important to emphasize that understanding place as a storied event and process creates the possibility for new forms of representation new ways of imagining our locality and new ways of navigating, both physically and metaphorically, our social and geographical milieus. The poem opens with the lines, quote, the rivers of my life, moving looms of light, end quote. Immediately, we can recognize that Harrison will be undertaking a topographical exploration of the self. Throughout the lines of verse, we'll drift between the language of representation like the rivers of my life, and the music of language, moving looms of light. For this presentation, I invite us to follow spatial theorist Robert Talley in considering, quote, the degree to which our perceptions of space and place 
come to determine our attitudes toward the world and all within it. While also recognizing the ways that place, space, and spatial relations actively shape us, forming us as individual and collective subjects and affecting the way we encounter and experience the world. Place is a storied event enmeshes and informs persons, non-persons, locations, and objects. And it may be interpreted as part of a reciprocally mediated unfolding process. This non-static unfolding blurs spatial boundaries in connection with both the human and the non-human as it impels this open-ended process along. Harrison invokes shape as an organizing principle or paradigm from the beginning of the poem. As a matter of fact, this poem was included in a collection uh, after it was published in 1985 titled The Shape of the Journey. Harrison says, quote, it is not so much that I got there from here, which is everyone's story, but the shape of the voyage, how it pushed outward in every direction until it stopped, end quote. Spatial articulations such as these are always generative of further spatial relations. And the poem points toward both storied processes and mimetic or imitative constructions of the world. We read, quote, the current lifts me up and out into the dark, gathering motion. How the water goes is how the earth is shaped, end quote. In her book, Spatial Engagement with Poetry, British theorist Heather Jung asserts that for poets like Harrison, quote, space, place, language, and the self are inextricably poetically linked. Our relationship with poetry is reciprocal and intimately associated with a sense of place and being, which is conflicted, liminal, and which oscillates between approach and departure, projection and retention, end quote. Harrison is, of course, a master at constellating the interwoven connections between place, language, and self. When we speak of place as a storied event and process, we are employing a perceptual metaphor, if you will, a useful figurative or descriptive trope that's not necessarily dependent upon one specific theoretical or metaphysical paradigm, but it's instead useful in multiple paradigms or even fields as a tool of a narrative enunciation and representation. We continually experience the powerful, beautiful, atrocious, and tragic proliferation of places. And in so doing, we begin to attune ourselves to the emergent stories or poems that arise from our participation in these place events. In reading Harrison's work, either poetry or fiction or nonfiction, we're almost always participating in the unfolding events of place, drawn in by his spatial imagery and his storied place events. Interpreting place as a processual happening in process lends itself to the work of unfixing and disrupting bounded localities and identities. And it enables place to be represented as both a geographical arena and a social construction. Other young notes again, quote, process is as important as end product. And so space operates as both noun and verb the subject and object of our scrutiny, and indeed of our being, end quote. Throughout the theory and practice of rivers, Harrison's words and images embrace a non-linear, shifting resonance of poetic sense that connects with, process, with notions of process and unfolding, rivers meandering. In the midst of searching for direction and a sense of purpose, near the end we read, quote, I turn toward the heavens and reach the top of my head. From there, I can go just about anywhere I want, and I've never found my way back home, end quote. Also, quote, I'm not quite alert enough to live. I'm trying to become alert enough to live, end quote. Our processes through the world are always narrativized, storied, poetic. Likewise, our yearnings or impulses to spatialize and artistically create our experiences of these processes. They're related closely to the manner in which language, whether it's poetry or the written word or the spoken word or fiction, language articulates and complicates the processes of spatializing our physical and emotional words, worlds. Place is a storied event and process encompasses ongoing socio-cultural relations, productions, memories, or imaginings, 
And as Indian American anthropologist Arjun Apadurai implies, place may be, quote, socialized and localized through complex and deliberate practices of performance, representation, and action. Here are some gestures to the storied nature of our lives in the middle of the poem. Within the section dedicated to the struggles of understanding life and our divergent journeys, he notes, quote, it is most of all the water of awakening, passing with the speed of life herself, drifting in circles in an eddy, joining the current again, as if the eddy were a few moments sleep. The story can't hesitate to stop, end quote. Place as storied encourages us to poetically, in Harrison's case, or narratively, articulate the meaning of our lives as embodied humans living in a material world. And within this paradigm, human expression of any sort, as Cherokee scholar Rachel Jackson identifies it, is a, quote, an animating power of local emplacement that facilitates the collective unfolding of experiences and discourses, end quote. Our experiences and understanding of place, therefore, are not ever fixed or stable. The theory and practice of rivers helps us to move beyond fixity in the sense of either transcending or eschewing both strictly linear temporality and strictly physical locality. The poem also helps us move beyond the realm of assured understanding and into spaces of experience without certainty. Poet and literary theorist Steve Connor encourages the effective reading of poetry. An affect theory uh, could you know, understand and interpret effects, often understood as emotions or subjective feelings, and to connect these affects or emotions with our interpretation of literature. In other words, Connor urges readers to always remember our initial and ongoing emotional engagements with the poem, even as we seek to interpret the words and images and as we attempt to appropriate them into our lives. For the reader of prose, reading may be undertaken primarily for meaning, for certainty, for understanding. And this is not always the case when reading poetry. Connor notes that the reader of poetry seeks to, quote, read effectively at a level of sensation and sensory impression upon which syntactic units are experienced more than understood. Harrison, in all his writings, and particularly in his poetic works, is much more concerned with the experiential nature of our existence than with certitude or definitive understanding or cornering the market on truth. Two beautiful lines from the theory and practice of Rivers illustrate his aesthetically experiential focus. In an almost mystical and phenomenological way, he muses, I don't wonder what is becoming to the man already becoming, end quote. In this moment, we hear the poet's emphasis on process over end result, on journeying over arriving, and on release rather than certitude. Then, Harrison speaks directly to understanding. He says, quote, I watched the first apple core float west on the slender current, my throat a knot of everything I no longer understand, end quote. In its manipulations of the representations of space and its challenges to mythic notions of understanding and certainty, the theory and practice of rivers is a poetic event and process. Now, the force of this particular poem I think stems from the profoundly rich senses of embodiment and emplacement through which it projects its world. As you may recall, Oedipus Moss, the main character in Thomas Pynchon's The Crying of Lot 49, speaks of projecting a world. And the totality of the theory and practice of rivers assuredly projects a world, and some would say many. One that is indelibly infused with the places it explores. Harrison yearns for emplacement, for groundedness, for ways to overcome or move through the haunting displacement he often experiences in general and specifically in the aftermath of the death of his niece. As readers early on in our reading and vocalizing of the poem, we're forced to acknowledge our shared struggle with Harrison as we attempt to reckon with our angst, anxiety, and uncertainty in navigating our places. Five times we read the lines, quote, the days are stacked against what we think we are. Five times we hear that emphatic phrase. Then we're told, quote, the days are finally stacked against what we think we are. How long can I stare at the river? End quote. Lastly, Harrison fantastically spatializes his universe, which is our world, and asks, quote, the days at last 
are stacked against what we think we are. Who in their most hallowed sleepless night with the moon seven feet outside the window, the moon that the river swallows, would wish it otherwise? End quote. Since locality and context are unavoidably involved in all our constructions of knowledge and understanding, we may as readers agree with Harrison that our worlds and our places could never be otherwise. In conclusion, let us remember that more often than not, place has traditionally been associated with physical localities that can be graphically mapped. The present reconceptualization here suggests that place is exceedingly more than a fixed, limited geospatial sphere or location or thing, and that places may be potential event sites for both relationality and transformation. It's true, poems enable us to inhabit worlds and experience transformation and relationality at sites and create and interpret geographies. Yet notions of worlds and sites and geographies may be understood in multiple, equally valid and important ways. What happens to the storied poetic nature of place events if place is not interpreted strictly as a physical geographical location? How may place be both storied and an event if place means an urban or digital space or an imagined space, how relevant is place today when we consider what Melanie Benson Taylor calls, quote, the unmoored sensibility of contemporary identity? As we reconceptualize place in our readings of Jim Harrison, we're not forced into a binary exclusivity in that we must always and definitively identify place as either one, a geophysical site, or two, a spatial expression, digital, urban, rural, or otherwise, not directly tied to locality. Instead, interpreting place events as socially constructed consequential geographies, like the geo, the cultural geographer Edward Soha said, it makes it possible for us to emphasize both conceptions and to do so if necessary at the same time. In the theory and practice of rivers, place becomes or embodies multiple modes of representation and creation. And as Robert Talley says, Place in the poem, quote, becomes less a locale, less a localizable or even recognizable site, and more a suddenly reimagined whirlwind of effective, cognitive, and experiential images, end quote. It becomes an emergent geography, a constellated figuration of subjective experience and objective space. For Harrison, spatial relations are present and active continually impacting and determining all the elements of the poem. In the first lines, we were told how the water goes is how the earth is shaped. Quite true. And in our readings of this haunting and majestic poem, we know that the rivers of our own lives are ceaselessly shaping our worlds. Thank you. Wonderful, Scott. Thank you. Very nice. And now we have Steve Spencer talking about sound in Jim Harrison's poetry. Hi, everybody. Uh, my piece is called Birds Again, Jim Harrison and the Poetry of Sound. And I'll begin with a poem of Jim's entitled Sound from his first collection, Plain Song, 1965. Sound. At dawn, I squat on the garage with snuff under a lip to sweeten the roofing nails. My shoes and pant cuffs are wet with dew. In the orchard, the peach trees sway with the loud weight of birds, green fruit, yellow haze. And my hammer, the cold head taps, then swings its first full arc. The sound echoes against the barn, muffled in the loft and out the other side, then lost in the noise of the birds as they burst from the trees. In a 2014 interview in the Atlantic's By Heart series with... Uh, Joe Fassler, Jim said, quote, when I begin writing, it's sound that guides me. Language, not plot. Plot can be overrated. What I strive for more is rhythm. When you have the rhythm of a character, the novel becomes almost like a musical composition. It's like taking dictation when you're really attuned to the rhythm of that voice, end quote. Um, and even though Jim is talking about uh, writing in a novel here, uh, obviously, uh, the rhythm of his uh, of his writing, especially in this poetry, is very very pronounced and and very careful. From his earliest published works, uh, he, Harrison experimented with form and technique. 
He was acutely aware of the sound and the rhythm of the words he chose to write his poems and his poetry. In his 1965 thesis, A Natural History of Some Poems, he, quote, included a few selections from my notebooks to give a larger sense of background, to hint at the often vague sort of mulling that occurs before a poem is conceived, end quote. Quote, pearl sweet, dulcet sounded milk of names, Shawnee, Arapaho, end quote. Quote, the voice must become prodigal, mangled, intolerable, end quote. Quote, the rhythms of natural speech must be tightly controlled or avoided altogether. They lull rather than interest, unless compressed into something accelerated, unnatural, end quote. And that's originally also from the notebooks in Soundings Magazine, spring 1967, SUNY New York. So listen to the descriptions of sounds as they push into the other senses present in Jim's poem, Exercise. Hear this touch, grass parts for the snake. In furrows, soil curves around itself. A rock topples into a lake. Roused organs, fur against cloth, arms unfold. At the edge of a clearing, fire selects new wood. That poem is also from Plain Song, 1965. Robert Hazel, in his introduction to Jim's reading at the 92nd Street Y in April 19th, 1965, said, quote, I'm astonished by the accuracy of his eye and ear. Harrison has 30-20 vision, an absolute pitch, very rare. It's more than a pleasure. It's a real excitement to encounter such honesty of capture of things in language and such living lyricism, unquote. In a 1984 interview in the Missouri Review, Kay Bonetti uh, takes note of Jim's reading style and, and remarks, you're a wonderful reader. How much do you write for the ear? And Harrison said, I don't consciously, but as a poet, you do. Yeats would think of the entire rhythm of the poem before he would fill in the words. You know, he says, I am of Ireland and the holy land of Ireland and time runs on, cried she. And you say, Jesus Christ, I don't know if it makes any sense, but it's beautiful. I think it comes from my early addiction to Stravinsky or Sonny Rollins or Miles Davis or Thelonious Monk. And that's finally the, the music you hear in your head. And you hear word music in that way, unquote. In a 2000 interview with Joseph Bednarik in Five Points magazine, Jim spoke about his process for writing uh, in a similar fashion. He was talking about his first novel, Wolf, where he said, quote, I outlined the novel musically first. Bednarik asked, what do you mean by that? And, and Jim said, I outlined the structure of the novel and I outlined the highs and lows like Yeats used to do with his poems. He hears the rhythm of the piece first and then I poured myself into this drawing of the structure. So it was basically a poet's novel. And the first paragraph runs two pages or so, end quote. And all those interview excerpts were from conversations with Jim Harrison, revised and updated, edited by Robert DeMott, University Press of Mississippi. In 1975, in another poetry reading, this one for the Library of Congress, poet Stanley Kunitz said in his introduction to Jim's writing, or Jim's reading, quote, more than most American poets, Jim Harrison would seem to be attached to a place, a place in the American heartland. Jim's Her Jim Harrison's poetry is of the earth, earthy, sexual, vital, undomesticated, intimate brawling. And though it is rooted in the land, it isn't folksy, woodsy, or bucolic in the usual sense. And though Michigan is in his bones, he is far from being a regional poet. These contradictions are manifest in the best contemporary yet written on his work, and uh, it, it ought to be since he wrote it himself, unquote. Uh, Jim Harrison's poetry is often sensuous and oftentimes sensual. He revels in the senses, the smells, uh, textures, sights and sounds, taste. And so it comes as no surprise that despite his avowal that he, quote, did not write by ear, unquote, the imagery in his poems is full of sound, and he pulls his lyric from the music from the, of the natural world, quote, Finch yodel and Mexican raven squawk, unquote. The, quote, incantatory moans of a bear, 
unquote. The sound of a snake slipping through tall grass, the, quote, crunch of windfall apples, unquote. So Harrison's heartland, his place, is full of sound. Again, in Kunitz's intro, he quotes Harrison, and he says, quote, my sympathies run hotly to the impure, the inclusive, to the realm of poetry. A poet at best speaks in the out loud speech of his tribe, deals in essences, whether political, social, or personal. All of the world literature is his province, though he sees it as a guild, only to be learned from as he must speak in his own voice, end quote. And Though he didn't consciously write from the ear, Harrison was aware of how certain of his poems did not lend themselves immediately to reading out loud. In that same 1975 reading with Mark Strand, uh, um, Jim Harrison says of Outlier and Gazals, quote, there are about 70 Gazals in this book, but they, and well, I wrote them all before I found out, I, I would have written them anyway, but they just don't read well unless you have eight poets in the room. And it's essentially an Arabic or North African form. And they just, they don't read well, end quote. Uh, that quote and uh, the previous was uh, from Jim Harrison and Mark Strand reading and discussing their poems in the Coolidge Auditorium in May 1975, uh, the Library of Congress. Here's a, a, one of his, Jim's poems called Marching. At dawn, I heard among bird calls the billions of marching feet in the churn and squeak of gravel. Even tiny feet still wet from the mother's amniotic fluid and very old halting feet, the feet of the very light and very heavy, all marching but not together, crisscrossing at every angle with sincere attempts not to touch, not to bump into each other, walking in the doors of houses and out the back door 40 years later, finally knowing that time collapses on a single plateau where they were all their lives, knowing that time stops when the heart stops as they walk off the earth into the night air. And that was marching from Saving Daylight, 2006, Copper Canyon Press. And you, you hear in that poem um, the sounds and, and the descriptions of sounds and the rhythm and Jim takes you on, you know, you, you, you get a sense of it um, as, as you read through the poem. And I think you get a, a more sense of the character of that poem when you actually read it out loud. In his essay, Poetry as Survival, in Antaeus Magazine, 1990, Jim wrote this often quoted observation, quote, poetry at its best is the language your soul would speak if you could teach your soul to speak, end quote. And in that same essay, he wrote of the poet Joe Harjo. Um, he said, Harjo's style is somewhat incantatory. There was an urge to hear her read aloud, end quote. So I'm going to finish with uh, a favorite poem of Jim's that I would argue falls into incantation. And I want you to listen for the rhetorical choices he uses for uh, repetition and from the rhythm all through this Poem. So walking, it's from Locations, uh, 1968. Walking, walking back on a chill morning past Kilmer's Lake into the first broad gully, down its trough and over a bridge of poplar, scrub oak, and into a larger gully. Walking into the slow, fresh warmth of mid-morning to Spider Lake, where I drank at a small spring remembered from 10 years back. Walking northwest two miles where another gully opened, seeing a stump on a knoll where my father stood one deer season and tiring of sleep and cold burned a pine stump, the snow gathering fire orange on a dull day. Walking past charred stumps blackened by the 1881 fire to a great hollow stump near a basswood swale. I sat within it on a November morning watching deer browse beyond my young range of shotgun and slug, chest beating hard for killing. Into the edge of a swale waist high with ferns, seeing the quick movement of a blue racer and thick curl of the snake against a birch log, a pale blue with nothing of the sky in it, a fleshy blue, blue of knotted veins in an arm. Walking to Savage's Lake where I ate my bread and cheese, drank cool lake water and slept for a while, dreaming of fire 
snake and fish and women in white linen walking, pinkish warm limbs beneath white linen, then walking, walking homeward toward Wells Lake, brain at boil now with heat, afternoon glistening in yellow heat, dead dun brown grass, windless with all distant things shimmering, grasshoppers, birds dulled to quietness, walking a log road near a cedar swamp looking cool with green darkness and wine of mosquitoes, crows call overhead, Cooper's hawk floating singly in mateless haze, walking dumbly, footsore, cutting into evening through sumac and blackberry brambles onto the lake road, feet sliding in the gravel, whippoorwills, night birds wakening, stumbling to the lake shore, shedding clothes on sweet moss, walking into syrupy August, moonless dark, water cold, pushing lily pads aside, walking out into the lake with feet springing on mucky bottom until the water flows overhead, sinking again to walk on the bottom, then buoyed up, walking on the surface, moving through beds of reeds, snakes and frogs moving to the far edge of the lake, then walking upward over the basswood and alders, the field of sharp stubble and hay bales toward the woods, floating over the bushy crests of hardwoods and tips of pine, barely touching in miles of rolling heavy dark, coming to the larger water, there walking along the troughs of waves folding in upon themselves, walking to an island, small, narrow, sandy, sparsely wooded, in the middle of the island, in a clump of cedars, a small spring, which I enter, sliding far down into a deep, cool, dark, endless weight of water. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Beautiful. So I'm gonna talk a little about Jim Harrison and Zen. And I'm gonna be reading from Turning Takahashi. Shinkichi Takahashi, Lucien Strick, and Zen in the poetry of Jim Harrison. I will be exploring one of Jim Harrison's encounters with Zen and Zen poetry, treating the circumstances of his first readings of the Japanese poet Shinkichi Takahashi. Harrison's critical review of Takahashi's book After Images and the Harrison poem that ultimately resulted from this encounter after reading Takahashi, 1975. In addition to probing the influence of Takahashi on Harrison, uh, the paper will clarify several historical and bibliographic details important to understanding Harrison's poetry after 1970. But first, the poem. Here is Jim Harrison's After Reading Takahashi from 1975. Nothing is the same to anyone Moscow is east of Nairobi, but thinks of herself as perpetually west. The bird sees the top of my head and even trade for her feathered belly, our eyes staring through the nose bridge, never to see each other. She is not I, I not her. So what, you think, having little notion of my concerns? Oh, that dank basement of so what, known by all, though never quite in the same way. All of us drinking through a cold afternoon, our eyes on the mirror behind the bottles, on the snow out the window, which the wind chases fruitlessly, each in his separateness, drinking, talk noises coming out of our mouths. In the corner, a pretty girl plays pinball. I have no language to talk to her. I have come to the point in life when I could be her father. This was never true before. The bear hunter talked about the mountains. We looked at them together, 
out of the tavern window in Emigrant, Montana. He spent 50 years in the Absorca Mountains hunting grizzly bears and one time wolves. We will never see the same mountains. He knows them like his hands, his wife's breasts and legs, his old dog sitting outside in the pickup. I see only beautiful mountains and say, beautiful mountains, to which he nods graciously, but they are a photo of China to me. And all lessons are fatal. The great snowy owl that flew in front of me so that I ducked in the car, it will never happen again. I've been warned by the snowy night, an owl, the infinite black above and below me, to look at all creatures and things with a billion eyes, not struggling with the single heartbeat that is my life. Jim Harrison was certainly not the first American writer to engage with Zen, poetry, practice, philosophy. In the transcendentalist tr tradition, the East was popularized for American writers through Emerson, Thoreau, and later Whitman. The source texts were usually Hindu, however, and infrequently Zen. Translations from Chinese or Japanese into English were rare. In the first decades of the 20th century, we see early modernist interest in Chinese texts, most famously in Ezra Pound, who arguably impressed the importance of Chinese writing for a generation of American poets, creating a dialogue of influence and modeling in a strain of modernist poetry that bore the stamp of traditional Chinese and Japanese poetry, whether haiku or song. We can see it in E.E. E. Cummings, William Carlos Williams, and Wallace Stevens, among others. After World War II, the Beat Generation represented a third engagement with the Eastern worldview. And it's among this generation of slightly elder poets, Kerouac, Ginsburg, Gary Snyder, who is still alive, that Jim Harrison found himself as he committed himself to poetry late in his adolescence. Significance to this moment too is the early work of Robert Bly and others in translating international texts for a new generation of writers, those who would read and publish and write in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Beginning in the late 1950s, Bly introduced such poems in his journal collections, the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, widely disseminated among writers. Harrison was familiar with Bly and read from these journals as he began his own poetic career, beginning with Plain Song in 1965. In 1968, Harrison and Dan Gerber founded Sumac, a literary magazine that included selected translations of Chinese poetry. The paper trail of Eastern encounters doesn't end there for Harrison, however. Two close friends, Peter Matheson and Gerber, had a profound influence on his engagement with Zen in particular. Matheson, the elder of the two, founded the Paris Review while working for the CIA and became a proponent of Zen practice and writing in the last years of the 60s and up to the period of Harrison's encounter with Takahashi. Matthewson and Harrison corresponded frequently. They had various connections and affinities, including wildlife. Indeed, one of Harrison's early favorite books was Matthewson's Wildlife in America, published in 1959, his very first book. Dan Gerber was junior to Harrison, but from the same area of Northern Michigan, a fellow Michigan State alumnus, and beginning in the late 60s, co-editor of Sumac, correspondent with Harrison and a student and practitioner of Zen. Despite being younger, Gerber became Zen mentor to Jim Harrison and introduced him to Kobun Chino Sensei, who had come to the United States in 1970 and was among the first Zen teachers in this country, widely known. In personal correspondence, Gerber says, quote, I can tell you the story of Takahashi. In the fall of 1972, 
Jim and I had lunch with Peter Mathewson in New York, we had been reading a just published book on Lake Rudolph done with Peter Beard's photographs. And Jim and I were planning a trip to Kenya and Tanzania in the winter of 1973. Peter Mathewson recommended two books to us, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, and Takahashi's After Images. Both of those books changed the course of my life in the following several years and had a great effect on Jim. We agreed that what these two books, and soon followed by Trumpa's Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism, didn't seem like anything new to us. They seemed more a clarification, an enhancement of a decade-long apprenticeship we'd been doing in poetry, end quote. So it is that Lucian Strick became an important mediating figure in Jim Harrison's poetry, giving American readers and writers access to texts hitherto unknown, including for Harrison. In a sense, his presence and work are part of what I will call a fourth American letters turn toward the East and specifically Zen. Indeed, Strick first translated Zen texts in the early 1960s and Takahashi in print with a Swallow Press edition in 1970. But it is the Doubleday anchor version of Strick translating Takahashi that Harrison reviews for the American Poetry Review in the spring of 1974. In that review, which was later included in his 1991 collection of nonfiction, Just Before Dark, entitled After Images, Zen Poems by Shinkichi Takahashi, Harrison begins to stake out the meaning of Takahashi's poetry for American poetry and for his own personal poetic sensibility. First, he offers us a crash course on the state of Zen in the United States as of 1974. He offers us the story of Ezra Pound's obsession with Confucianism, which Harrison rejects as wrongheaded a useless validation of bureaucracy and worth nothing to poetry. He goes on to name Alan Watts, D.T. Suzuki, and ultimately Gary Snyder, whom he venerates above all. Then he introduces Strix, poetic and translational efforts, and stresses the importance of encountering and knowing Takahashi for American audiences. He offers the paradox of American unfamiliarity with such a talented voice. He writes, quote, no matter the international efforts that have been made, we recognize how desperately feeble and parochial our poetry is when Shinkichi Takahashi reaches 72 before all but a very few of us know he exists, end quote. In treating Takahashi, Harrison is most adamant about the quality in Takahashi that he calls thingness. He comments, quote, when Takahashi writes of a crow, it is an actual crow, not as in so much of our poetry, a convenient fulcrum on which to dangle an idea or our neuroses, end quote. This thingness in Harrison and in Takahashi is at once singular, as in Crow, but also myriad things. Harrison writes that Takahashi's power over readers is the Zen sense of the myriad. Quote, part of the power must come from the fact that the poet, that is Takahashi, has 10,000 centers as a Zenist, thus is virtually centerless, end quote. Here we see Harrison arguing for a move that would increasingly be the turn of his own poetry. The myriad world is valuable in its own right and not as ego reflection for the poetry. Poet, that Harrison attempted the poem after reading Takahashi so close to the time of his review is perhaps worth noting. He clearly had identified a master a mentor that he thought worthy of emulation or interpretation. Additionally, we may observe a particular synergy. Harrison first published the poem 
in Lucian Strick's important compendium of Midwestern poets, the two volume series entitled Heartland. This poem appears in Heartland too. Here in these Strick books, Harrison's Takahashi interpretation finds a home among a pantheon of wonderful poets, Gwendolyn Brooks, Robert Bly, Mary Oliver, Stanley Plumley, James Wright, Dan Gerber, and this astonishing list just goes on. In the poem, as we've heard, Harrison commences with, nothing is the same to anyone. He quickly dispenses with any notion that any thing can be understood in a singular sense. Like Takahashi's frequent use of the sparrow, Harrison uses a bird's vision of a man and a man's incomplete vision of a bird to emphasize that one thing can never be substituted for another. A bird is a bird, not a metaphor for the life of the poet or merely an idea in the world. It is not a thing on which we might hang a metaphor, to paraphrase the language of his Takahashi book review. The poem goes on to describe the denizens of a rural bar in Montana, a bar that contains a mirror, reflected bottles, the vast panorama of mountains outside the tavern window. What is clear is that each thing, each image, each personage, while aggregated in this setting, is its own thing, and each person perceives it distinctly. To the girl, he offers, quote, I have no language to talk to her, unquote, creating that emphasis. And to the bear hunter, he is emphatic. We will never see the same mountains. The poem ends on an important turn during the last eight lines. Seeing a great snowy owl fly in front of the car, the poet senses a warning. It is a caution, an instruction, an imperative, and a compulsion. Quote, to look at all creatures and things with a billion eyes, not struggling with the single heartbeat that is my life, end quote. As Gerber noted, and as Harrison described in the essay, Everyday Life, The Question of Zen, written in 1991, Trung Pa's cutting through spiritual materialism offered poets a version of literary spirituality framed in a new way one that Harrison adopts. And here I quote from Trung Pa, quote, general awareness is absent in our lives. We are completely absorbed in whatever we are doing and we forget the rest of the environment. We seal it off. But the positive force of compassion is open and intelligent, sharp and penetrating, giving us a panoramic view of life, which reveals not only specific actions and events, but their whole environments as well. That from 1987, originally published in 1970. Sometime after the period of Harrison's review of after images, Harrison began citing the uh, Zen mystic Do Zhen in interviews, essays, and even his fiction. The examples are numerous. Usually Harrison's quote is a paraphrase of this from Do Zhen. Quote, to study the Buddha way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be actualized by myriad things. End quote. With Luthi Lucian Strick's translations, the model of Takahashi and tutelage in Zen practice under Matheson, Gerber, Trungpa, and others, Harrison increasingly emphasized and interpreted the world through a Zenist lens, offering the thingness of the world, emphasizing myriad phenomena, and uncovering possible catalogs of the world wherein all things are considered. The poet is successful by leaving ego aside as possible, or in bracketing ego in such a way as to emphasize other things, their thingness. While he characterized himself as a somewhat hapless Zen practitioner, witness his tricycle piece, it would be a mistake to underestimate the power of this turn towards Zen in Harrison. It's a turn in voice, treatment, persona, and suggests a movement in poetry and English 
that Robert Bly once characterized as a moving away from the second position. It's the move in which romantic poets often saw the natural world as a metaphor for psychic life of the individual poetic protagonist. Here, with Takahashi, Harrison begins to turn in a new direction. It gives us additional access and understanding to many of Harrison's strongest poems this turn. From 1987's The Theory and Practice of Rivers, from After Ikkyu to the final poems of Dead Man's Float, written in 2016, we see the imprint of Harrison's turn toward Takahashi between 1970 and 1974. It's a voice absorbed by the myriad. While early Harrison poems often evinced that Keatsian voice centered on the poetic ego and the lyric tradition, later poems turn toward a non-dual perspective taking. Witness the catalogs of natural phenomena in a poem like Walking, which we heard from, from Steve, but this is accelerated after his encounter with Takahashi. Where later poetry is evocative of Keats, it's often a reinterpretation of Keats' famous negative capability in terms of the zenith capacity of the poet to hold multiple perceptions at once, perceptions that emphasize phenomena in their own right, as we saw in after reading Takahashi. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Should we open right into questions or observations? Absolutely. I, if, if you don't mind me jumping right in, I, I'm really struck by bo both the connection between both of your work really um, you know, I just when talking about like when you, you say Harrison turned into a new direction, you know, after Takahashi and, and in a way that leads me back into the whole geolocating thing and, and just the sense of place that Scott was talking about. And so much of this in his work, both poetry and memoir and, and any of his storytelling is these little jumping off points. Um, whether it was being blinded, you know, the boy ran to the woods and, and what that did and, and just how, how that shift in his vision, you know, that to me also leans for me into very often people talk about blindness where your other senses are, are more enhanced. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I just randomly or whatever, I find really lovely connections between all three pieces. Yeah, and I, I, I made my comments about walking and that turn um, with some trepidation because, uh, of course, the, uh, the walking is one of my favorite poems of all time. But I think it does, um, it's, it's evidence of sort of the poet moving through the world. Mm -hmm. um, and you can sense that he's about to make a move where the world becomes more present. Um, and then, but you see him in this poem in 1975, sort of, if you will, wrestling with the poet looking at the world and characterizing it versus the world being itself and being allowed to speak for itself. And so I, I found this to be a kind of fascinating moment of, or turn. Um, and I think, I think he struggled with it. I think as any artist or as any of us would, um, but I, I see it as this kind of fulcrum moment. Yeah, I think so. I think it's interesting, too. You think about a turn uh, whenever Steve was talking about the Kunitz quote that he seemed to be attached to a place in that regard. You know, he is attached to it, but his attachment before and after the turn seemed to take different manifestations. He was talking mm -hmm. about how he perceives it, how he perceives himself of the world, in the world, moving through the world, connected to it. And I thought it was something to consider in connection to your statement, Chris, where he was, you know, said we have to be, quote, actualized by a myriad things mm -hmm. and not just one particular thing. So there was a, mm -hmm. Well, a yes, there too. Well. And the, the geolocation of the, the river in the theory and practice of rivers is there's the moment in the poem where he says, how long can I 
stand here staring at the river because he realizes it would be madness for his life to be only the river um because of course he has to engage in the world too so you can see him wrestling with that um and he captures it beautifully um I but of course so. there are moments in that poem where the river is a metaphor for something yeah and you know it makes me think of his often quoted um, sort of ref- refutation of Heraclitus. We only step in the same river, you know, twice. Well, he he goes on to say we never even step in the same one once, and so right. it's uh, so it's a similar connection. Right, and that 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 we never step in the same river once makes me think about what he says about the girl and the bear hunter in the bar, which is, yes, he can talk to them, but it will never be the language that actually is the language that matches who they are, mm-hmm. um, because perception being what it is mm-hmm. yeah. i thought i might want to throw a question to steve I, I, you know you talked about his emphasis on rhythm and sound and how important it was to him regardless of whether it was before or after the turn i think we see that i would to see if you might talk a little bit more about your interest in developing a, a paper on the sound of the work when you have a quote that says the music you hear in your head is you know word music um, so if you would say a little more about the the majesty or the power or the the pull of Harrison's word music, yeah. Well, you know, for me, I, I'm I'm really struck, and and this put me to mind. Um, uh, I, I'm just can you hear this lawn lawn work sound out here? It's not too bad. Okay, great. Oh, wow. um, I, I'm really put in mind of uh, it, when I was in uh, undergraduate school. Uh, there was a program that was put together to get actors from the theater department to go over and uh, speak to kids in the English department who were learning about Shakespeare because they were just having to read the pieces and they didn't really, you know, it can get boring. How do I understand that? And, and the whole point of Shakespeare, of course, it it wasn't ever written to be, uh, to be as, as book, book form, uh, but rather to be spoken out loud. Mm -hmm. And so very often I'm very, myself, I'm very drawn to that, um, uh, to the rhythms and then also just to hear it out loud. And even uh, just in general, I I think it's, it's safe to say that with uh, poetry, the more you read something out loud, the more it's easier to commit it to memory. And that's very often how I, I have to learn things. And so with Jim's work and, and I, I can't, Unfortunately, uh, like you, gentlemen, I probably can't like cite a specific time, but it seems to me that early on he was very concerned and interested in the rhythm and, of course, in other poets work as well. And so just finding these little inklings and some of them, as I said, were transcripts I made myself from uh, a couple of the poetry readings he did because I couldn't find anything on paper. I was just wondering you know, did he ever, you know, did he choose to, to write for sound? And except for those references to music, very often he was talking about his novel writing. But of course, all his novel writing and all that fiction really is, is to a certain extent, is an offshoot of his poetry. I think he was a mm-hmm. poet sort of first and foremost. I think it's interesting that um, his references to music show up in his fiction And they show up in his nonfiction, including some of his food writing, where references to things like reggae or mariachi music will actually coincide with the the rhythm and the feeling and the language of the piece. But when he writes poetry, I think I think that Mozart and Stravinsky and other things are in the poetry, but he doesn't reference them because because that's part of the, the art is to not mm-hmm. show to, to not show that he's thinking or using that sound to right. just let the sound speak for itself. Exactly. No uh, so, sound kind of guides notes. the I'm sorry. No, that's it. Uh, just no, no footnotes within his poem. It's just yeah, you're saying yeah, sound kind of guides. His sound is guiding the form without you know explicitly acknowledging what shape this form is going to take in reaction to what he's hearing. And then yeah, we get yeah. to read it and then we get to into it, what we think might be happening there. So. Right. And I, I think especially just more, if I can answer your question a little bit better, Scott, is I think what strikes me is uh, it's not just the sound of me or anyone reading the poem or Jim reading the poem out loud. Uh, of course, he had a very particular cadence of his own that 
it's safe to say was not particularly, you know, stentorian. Um, but, <laughs> but it's his descriptions of sounds and how they, how they do fall into the other senses and, and birds, which really all, all three of our um, pieces, I think at some point or another references birds and Jim's connections to birds. But to me, it was always so much about uh, not just the descriptions of say bird song, uh, sometimes the rhythm or the magic in the name of the bird, uh, sometimes the sound of birds, you know, suddenly erupting from the trees, you know, that burst uh, that he talked about in, uh, in the poem sound. I, I'm yeah, there's a passage in um, the Golden Window where there's uh, thousands of birds in France and, and Collier where he describes all those birds on the roofs outside the window and you hear it you know, at dawn. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it speaks to the depth and power and, uh, you know, capability of, of Jim as a poet and that you, Steve can talk about the, the imagery being full of sound and uh, Chris can talk about his imagery being a focus upon a multiplicity of perspectives. And I can focus on the spatial aspects. Exactly. And, you know, it just shows how, how uh, remarkable, remarkably gifted he was in representing and creating these things. So, no yeah. question. I think, I think that's very true. And thank you, um, Scott, for that. I also think that we're doing in this conversation, something that I hope is at least somewhat important, which is there hasn't been a lot of writing and research and scholarship into Jim Harrison's poetry. Um, so this is an attempt um, to build more of that literature and maybe to spur further inquiry um, because a quick search of, uh, Stephen, as you said, you had to work from transcripts from recordings, whereas there's actually not a lot <clears throat> in the literature about the questions that 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 you addressed or that any of us have addressed as far as the poetry is concerned right mm -hmm. well i think it's a great opportunity what with uh we're hard upon complete poems getting ready to be released and uh included in that are some unpublished pieces uh some pieces that maybe he was working on um uh after you know what would have probably been toward his his next book if if he'd gotten there but you know, now it's just a lot more opportunity for somebody to look at that whole uh, work and all his poetry together and, and really, you know, uh, make a meal of it because I think there's just so much there. Um, I, I, I want I to ask because I was really struck by, um, you know, I think you both uh, sort of uh, talked a little bit, uh, obviously in different ways about nature and, and place in Jim's work. Um, but Jim liked to quote, and again, I think uh, Scott, you said something, some, some of the, he kind of quoted, or Chris, you said that, you know, in a, in a, he would kind of quote, but he would always sort of quote Shakespeare and say, we are nature too. He did that in lots of interviews and, and, and some stories. And, and I, I think that his connection to the outdoors, whether it be, uh, you know, from a sense of place or whether it just be when he had to escape, you know, the madding crowds or whatever, you know, he talked, uh, he's talked in, in his memoir. And then also, I think there were poems about, you know, him hiding inside one of those massive pine stumps uh, up, up in the north where it had been clear cut, you know, 150 years ago or whatever. Um, and so I, 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 I wonder then, do, have you found in his poetry more, you know, this is Jerry Garcia talk in, in some of the poems, but any more very specific uh, mentions of, of music or musical artists um, in, in, in his work? I, I, I would say, as I mentioned a little earlier, um, that he often brings music to the table, so to speak, in writing about food right. um, and wine. Um, so that's a phenomenon. Um, he also fills his longer fiction and the novellas with references to art and song and music. Um, it's often Mozart, it's often Stravinsky, 
sometimes it's you know reggae um, there are places too where he rejects um, what he would call consensus music or art where he rejects rock and roll or rock music as being sort of brain numbing uh enervating mm -hmm. and um so i think he wants the song or the music to be something unique distinct artful um and not part of like the popular cadence of life uh, and that maybe is making too much of it but but that's the combination that i see mm -hmm. sure and i remember you know and and really culturally or even musically strong contradistinction to some to mozart or stravinsky remember in a number of places in both novellas and then uh maybe in uh, full-length novels <laughs> he mentions uh none other than merle haggard and uh right. turned 21 in prison doing mm -hmm. life without parole you know mama tried so he's got the uh, he's got his particular sources of inspiration that he draws from that are not in any way predictable in my mind. So, yeah. Yeah. And he loved a, a, a Native American jazz musician, Jim Pepper, whose right. music is highly idiosyncratic um, and actually was at least a decade or two ahead of its time relative to a number of indigenous things we might listen to today from, from contemporary artists. Um, so he was looking for things that were not consensus um, sounds or images or experiences. Sure. And I, you know, Steve mentioned uh, the, the, the incantatory poet Joy Harjo is one of my favorites. Right. And I, as a matter of fact, you're talking about indigenous poets learned of the Montana poet ML Smoker through right. you know, Jim's work as well. So yeah, yeah. it's non, non uh, traditional approach to things as well he he dedicates a poem to ml smoker I, i'm forgetting what it is right this second yeah. but um yeah that's where i discovered who she was so, right yeah. Yeah. yeah well gentlemen we need to wrap up thank you so much for this and um we invite um viewers and listeners to um participate in the jim harrison society american literature association um, to go out and get um, their Copper Canyon press copy of the collected poems, The Heart's Work, which should be out in a matter of, of, of weeks or months, I believe, right, Steve? Yeah, yeah, yeah almost any time. The complete poems, let me just say, as opposed to uh, just the collected. Yep, please. yep, yeah. Um, so, so thank you. And, yeah. um, and we will conclude there.